Hello, and welcome to Flying Failures, where we'll be looking at the Aviation Traders ATL-90 Accountant. Built by the Aviation Traders Company of businessman Freddie Laker, the ATL-90 Accountant was envisaged to be the company's first foray into developing its own model so as to help support the wider business and extend its influence within the ever-expanding market for Douglas DC-3 replacements. Only for multiple aerodynamic problems to render the sole prototype of this promising airliner a largely unrecognized failure, and nearly bringing its manufacturer to the brink of bankruptcy. Established by rising star of the aviation industry, Freddie Laker, Aviation Traders Engineering Limited, or ATEL, had been created in 1947 as a means of tapping into the lucrative market for post-war surplus aircraft sales, as with tens of thousands of fighters, bombers and transport models now no longer required following the end of World War II in 1945, there was ample scope to convert these machines for new walks of life in the civilian sector, and thus ATEL undertook its first commission by converting six ex-RAF Handley Page Halifax heavy bombers into cargo planes for use by Bond Air Services, followed by their crowning achievement in 1948 during the Berlin Airlift, where Laker bought up all manner of models, including the notorious Avro Tudor and Vickers Viking, and repurposed them for use as transports to ship in vital supplies for the besieged city of West Berlin, as the Soviet Union was poised to starve the last enclave of capitalism in the communist-ruled East Germany. By the early 1950s, though, it was more than apparent that the biggest market seller would be a model that could replace the pre-war Douglas DC-3 and its wartime transport equivalent, the C-47 Dakota, of which 20,000 examples had been produced and a vast majority of which remained in service being bought up by European airlines as stopgaps to rebuild their civilian air corridors until newer aircraft could be developed towards the end of the decade, the first slew of mainstream regional propeller airliners coming in the form of the Convair CV240 and the Vickers Viking, both of which found dedicated customers, but by 1950 were starting to fall severely out of step, as trends moved towards turboprop technology, as pioneered by the Vickers Viscount of 1948. Soon the task of replacing the DC-3 had been superseded by the task of replacing the Viscount as a viable turboprop regional airliner, two of the earliest contenders for the task being the Handley Page Herald, which was initially powered by four Alvis Leonidas Major radial piston engines due to the builder's hesitancy to incorporate turboprops, and the Fokker F-27 Friendship of the Netherlands, the latter selling in huge numbers thanks to its incorporation of Rolls-Royce Dart turboprops from its inception, while the former, after the launch of the first prototype, was found that, even with four engines, these piston power plants could not compensate for the smoothness and efficiency of dedicated turboprops, and thus was redesigned into the two-engine Dart Herald that ultimately entered sales too late to be an effective competitor to the F-27. However, despite it only specialising as a converter and scrap dealer of second-hand aircraft, Laker decided that ATEL should throw its hat into the ring when it came to developing a viable competitor to the F-27 and the Dart Herald, the ATEL company having expanded greatly since the end of the Berlin airlift in 1949 and had added to its remit aircraft component manufacture, including the creation of wing center sections and wing spar modifications for Bristol freighters. Laker envisaging that, in order to replace the 44 Douglas DC-3s currently at use with UK domestic carrier British European Airways, or BEA, he should develop a turboprop model that matched the capacity and rugged dependability of the Dakota, while at the same time undercutting the established giants of Handley, Page and Fokker through competitive pricing. Laker employing, from 1952, former assistant chief designer at Hunting Aircraft, Toby Heal, to help develop this new machine at the Aviation Traders Base of Stansted Airport. By 1953, the model, designated the ATL-90, had moved from the early concept stage to full development at the South End ATEL factory and was promoted heavily at that year's Farnborough Air Show, with cross-section illustrations presenting a side-opening nose to allow for the straight-in loading of cars for air ferry flights, 15 stretches for medical evacuation runs, or lengthy pieces of cargo such as steel girders or other construction equipment, heel patenting a year later what would be known as the tension skin system of construction, which was based on the principles of taking the basic design of earlier wooden fabric aircraft, in which much of the stiffness of the airframe was provided by the fabric covering that was tightened by doping, but would, under his proposal, achieve the same rigidity with a metal skin, the concept requiring the aircraft's fuselage be designed so that its outer skin is curved in two directions at once, both around its circumference and along its length, meaning that, thanks to the metal skin's contribution to the strength of the structure, the fuselage could be considerably lightened to increase payload, the improved cost-to-weight ratio for the model over its rivals giving rise to the aircraft's moniker of the accountant, reflecting the favourable profit figures such a machine would present to the accounting team of prospective customers. 
The basic design of the ATL-90 was for a low-wing monoplane powered by Rolls-Royce Dart turboprops that could carry up to 36 passengers across a range of 1,300 miles at a cruising altitude of 25,000 feet and a top speed of 276 miles an hour, while a rugged tricycle landing gear would allow it to work into underdeveloped or impromptu runways in a vein similar to that of the Dakota, meaning it had strong potential for both civilian and military applications on transport or humanitarian runs into some of the world's most remote regions while at the same time taking on a distinctive curved fuselage profile that was broadly reminiscent of the iconic Lockheed Constellation. Production models for the accountant intended to be fitted with a swing nose to allow for straight-in loading of freight or cars, and thus required an aft nose wheel position, giving the aircraft a rather ungainly appearance on the ground, while the dart nacelles were mounted high above the wing so as to both gain the highest possible efficiency from the turboprops, which work best with an exhaust path that is as straight as possible, but also granting a higher propeller position that allowed for a shorter undercarriage, as well as reducing the risk of debris ingestion when landing at unprepared airfields. While the Mark I accountant was proposed as a direct replacement for the Douglas Dakota, early design work was also undertaken as to a stretched variant dubbed the Mark II, which would accommodate 42 passengers so as to compete with the larger Dart Herald and Fokker F-27, while the Mark III would take the Mark II and increase its range through a larger fuel capacity. Although as development on the Mark I continued, costs began to mount, and the subsequent Mark II and III became threatened, while Laker, amid his attempts to ask Rolls-Royce chairman, Lord Hives, to loan him two Dart engines for the prototype, was challenged by Hives due to his insistence that ATL owed money to his firm, only for Laker to check his own numbers and find that Rolls-Royce actually owed ATL money, a debt which was settled through the loaning of two Dart power units, although despite this small victory, the accountant's progress had slowed to a crawl by early 1956 and amid the first flights of both the Herald and the Fokker F-27 a year earlier, the proposed three prototypes for the ATL-90 had now been reduced to one, the only advantage the accountant had over its rivals being that, as the Herald had originally employed four uncompetitive radial engines to do the work of two turboprops, it required a lengthy and expensive conversion to the latter configuration, a drawback not experienced with the ATL-90. In the end, the ATL-90 accountant rolled out of the South End hangar in April 1957 without ceremony, and was essentially in finalised form, minus propellers on the engines or any interior furnishings, while being finished in an attractive red and white livery with the registration Golf 41-1, the somewhat uncertain faith in the company's first bespoke model being reflected in that, prior to its maiden flight, the aircraft was fitted with a large anti-spin parachute and an extended tail cone. Taxi trials for the accountant commencing upon the completion of Southend's newly constructed main runway from July 5th of the same year, and was handled by ATL Chief Test Pilot Lawrence Stewart Smith and Chief of Flight Test Derek Turner. The maiden flight of the ATL-90 eventually taking place four days later, with company engineers, employees, invited guests, and Freddie Laker himself in attendance, during which the accountant experienced severe stability and buffeting problems that led Stuart Smith opting to fly at a low altitude and return to the airport after only 21 minutes. Although in the face of the cheering crowds, Stuart Smith chose not to disclose publicly how troublesome the first flight of the accountant had actually been. Undergoing five weeks of revisions, which included adjusting the tailplane incidents in the hope of curing some of the aircraft's handling problems, the ATL-90 undertook two taxi runs and a second flight on August 12th, but was soon grounded again when the buffeting continued, the magnitude of which was so severe that at some speeds the instrument panels were rendered unreadable and the tailplane was visibly vibrating, ATL attempting to trace the source of the buffeting through the fitting of wool tufts and streamers to the engine nacelles and trailing edge of the wing, with the cause of the problematic control issue being found to be emanating from the rear of the engine nacelles, thereby leading to the dark jet pipes being extended to the rear, a solution that seemed to resolve the handling issues of the unruly aircraft and thus allowed it to be provided a certificate of airworthiness by the Secretary of State for Air being given, in one of the first instances of this occurring, its own bespoke registration of Golf Alpha Tango Echo Lima. In order to ensure the aircraft's appearance at the Society of British Aerospace Companies show at Farnborough in September of that year, which was a major marketing opportunity for Laker's upcoming airliner, the ATL-90 undertook a rigorous testing regimen so as to drum up the necessary 10 hours minimum flight time for the new model, carrying out daily demonstration flights over South End that wooed eager onlookers who had gathered at the edge of the airfield. Although due to a misunderstanding on the flight deck, one of the test sorties ended with the brakes being burned out upon landing, the accountant being very impressive to the general public, but not to the trade visitors who Laker was courting as potential customers, most of whom took umbrage at the aircraft's large tail, odd nose wheel undercarriage, and prominent engine nacelles, 
arguing that the machine appeared to be cobbled together from various other contemporary airliners. And while the Indian Air Force took a brief interest in the accountant, no firm orders were placed, clients being deterred not only by its looks, but also by the fact that the model had no delivery date and no additional units were in production. Desperate to drum up support for the ATL-90, and seeing that his own company had not the infrastructure or manpower to undertake a rigorous testing and high-capacity production process, Laker turned to Gloucester Aircraft as a means of potentially seeing a partnership, wherein the latter would assemble accountants at their Hucklecote factory. Gloucester, who was short on large-scale construction projects at the time, ultimately declining Laker's offer, while another potential partnership with Hunting Percival also failed to materialize, when the Luton-based manufacturer carried out an assessment of the model to consider its feasibility determining that a substantial redesign would be necessary to sort out the flaws of the ATL-90's aerodynamics and systems. The inability for Laker to garner the support of another aircraft builder with larger production facilities, meaning that plans for the 40-seat Accountant Mark II had to be put on hold, with the first units not available for delivery until 1961 at the earliest, putting it four years behind the highly popular F-27 and two years behind the less-renowned Dart Herald. Regardless of this bleak outlook, testing continued on the sole prototype, but soon, as costs continued to spiral, and with no firm orders or any other interest being placed, it rapidly became apparent to Laker that the accountant's time had long since come and gone, and thus, on January 10, 1958, the ATL-90 undertook its last ever flight after 30 sorties and 50 hours of flight testing, the accountant being a clear indication that, despite Laker's best efforts, his firm simply had not the infrastructure or experience needed to create its own dedicated model the entire project having heavily drained the profits of both ATL and Laker's own private carrier, Air Charter, meaning that, upon the end of the scheme, severe job cuts had to be administered in order to balance the books. Golf Alpha Tango Echo Lima being parked outside the hangar in which it was built at South End, with its engines being removed and returned to Rolls-Royce, before finally facing the scrapman's torch in February 1960. Instead, the rugged and dependable turboprop for the British airliner market would come to pass as the successor to the Vickers Viscount, the Avro 748, a model comparable in performance to the F-27 and the Dart Herald, but presented a unique selling point in that it was built to be as rugged as possible for use in the world's most remote regions. The similarities between the 748 and the ATL-90 accountant being so pronounced that Laker would hold a strong grudge against Avro for what he perceived to be a stolen idea, dubbing the machine the Avro Accountant. While in the United States, a similarly rugged turboprop would enter production in the form of the Grumman Gulfstream 1, an aircraft which would exist solely as an executive transport. As for Aviation Traders Limited, to try and cover the losses of the failed accountant project, Laker would go on to sell his shares in both the ATL firm and his own airline, Air Charter, at the end of 1958 for £600,000, plus a further £200,000 subject to the valuation of stock, with both companies falling under the control of the Airwork Group. While in 1961, ATL's most notorious bespoke model, the Douglas DC-4 based Carvair, would be launched as a dedicated car ferry aircraft to replace the aging Bristol freighter on vital ferry flights across the English Channel and the Irish Sea, as well as proving to be a useful machine for oversized freight loads. The general concept behind the Carvair being derived from the previous car carrying variant of the accountant dubbed the ATL-96, although the Carvair would ultimately be the last product from the ATL firm, the name falling dormant until 1996 when Airworks subsidiary, Britavia, would be rebranded Aviation Traders Limited, and today provides design and certification services for some of the world's leading airlines, aircraft lease companies, overseas military operational entities, and maintenance organizations. In the end, the ATL-90 accountant was an aircraft based on generally sensible principles, essentially providing what the later Avro 748 would achieve by giving carriers a far more rugged turboprop airliner that could outperform the older Douglas DC-3, but was comparable to other contemporary turboprop models of the time, the main constraint of the accountant simply being Freddie Laker's lack of resources and expertise when it came to developing and marketing his own bespoke airliner model. And it was this inexperience that ultimately saw the end of the ATL-90, a model filled with promise, but not enough to save itself from coming undone.